we can potentially talk about, and a lot in, uh, in very specific areas. Uh, so there have been entire papers written about certain vulnerabilities and certain and ways to protect against those vulnerabilities. This will be more of an overview uh, to give you a general idea about what to expect when you're dealing with XML. And sometimes, even when you don't think that you are dealing with XML. So um, just a few words, uh, general words, about uh, what, this, what this entire uh, presentation is going to be all about. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I think the attendees are muted for it. Um, so uh, my name is Balash, uh, Balash Kish. Uh, so technically, my last name is pronounced as Kish. And I assure you that in Hungarian, that's a perfectly chromulent last name. It's actually one of the most common last names in Hungary. Uh, it means little, literally, if you just take the uh, meaning of it. Um, but it always, it's always a pretty good icebreaker when I travel to an English-speaking country and they look at my last name and I think I'm pranking them. I'm totally not. And uh, there are so many other people with this last name in this country. It's just that the country itself is so small, I think we have about 10 million people, that uh, it's very possible you probably have never encountered any of us. Right, so um, let's just get straight into it and uh, take a look at what we are going to be talking about uh, this morning. So uh, like I said, this is going to be a more of a general overview of the various security issues over XML uh, and focusing on a few areas. Mainly, um, the two areas are going to be XML injection, uh, which, as we all know, with injection being the number one uh, threat, the number one risk in the US top 10, it is a pretty critical topic. Uh, and the other one is going to be XML entity and the various vulnerabilities related to misuse and abuse of the XML entities. Um, it will also be a pretty good uh, example of, uh, of a kind of vulnerability uh, that many people may not even know it exists because they don't use the underlying technology but it's still available for the attackers, unfortunately. Um, and throughout this webinar, I will also show a few real examples uh, of how these vulnerabilities work in a virtual machine, uh, so you can see uh, what happens when uh, a vulnerability like this is exploited in practice. And of course, uh, since we are not just about breaking things, uh, I also mention about some, some general ways of protecting yourself. Uh, unfortunately, because each programming language and each web platform has its own ways of protecting yourself against these vulnerabilities, uh, that kind of discussion can get very wide very quickly. So I will just be focusing on uh, general things that you can do. Uh, thankfully, usually the way to protect against these vulnerabilities is relatively simple. So I will be focusing on those. And in the end, depending on how much time we have, I'll also show a few real-world examples of these vulnerabilities from the near, uh, near, uh, near past, so the last few years, uh, to show you how these do happen in the real world and what kind of consequences they can have. So before we begin, just a few words about myself and what, is, what this academy thing is all about. Uh, so my name is uh, Balash Kish, um, and I am from Budapest, Hungary, uh, from a company called Skademy or Secure Coding Academy. And really just a few words about what we are and what we do. We originally started as a research uh, laboratory for the Technical University of Budapest. And we researched the area of application security in the late 90s. Eventually, we progressed to penetration testing and security evaluation. And finally, we came to the conclusion that the best way to solve this problem is to educate developers about these typical kinds of problems that we kept finding over and over again uh, during our evaluation projects. Uh, so my specific experience in this area has mainly been uh, security evaluations of various IoT devices and embedded devices, uh, such as mobile phone platforms. Um, and also, I've been uh, active in some areas of research, mostly related to fast testing, uh, so active security, uh, dynamic security testing, and also static code analysis and uh, threat modeling, as well as methodologies for security evaluation. And of course, I've also been involved with the activities of the Secure Coding Academy itself, uh, developing a lot of the material that we have and uh, also delivering it uh, into a lot of different countries. I hope that I will visit Australia one day or maybe Antarctica. All right, now let's get to the actual meat of things. Let's take a look at XML and uh, why it can be a tricky uh, technology to work with, especially with respect to security. 
So XML, uh, as I'm sure uh, all of you are aware, as you have used, probably used it in the past, is a markup language to represent diverse uh, sets of data. Uh, it has a lot of specifications, probably several hundred pages, or maybe even thousands of pages by now. Um, and uh, because it has been very actively used and developed uh, for uh, many uh, decades, uh, especially uh, around the area uh, around the time of the dot com boom, but it has seen a lot of use even in modern applications. Um, unfortunately, XML is uh, not uh, an ideal uh, an ideal solution for everything. So every kind of data representation. It has some issues uh, with uh, things such as uh, representing binary data. Uh, representing international internationalized data. So, for example, if you want to have an XML that has different languages uh, of, of data in it, so for, for example, you have an English version or a French version of the same text, uh, that can be perhaps problematic. Uh, it also has issues when you're trying to represent data uh, that has some of the meta characters of XML itself, uh, such as the uh, Angular brackets, as a typical example. Some other typical issues that come up with XML is uh, the management of schemas. Because many developers uh, don't like schemas. Because creating a schema, and we'll talk about schemas a bit later, uh, a schema is something, uh, it's, it's a document that you can use to verify the structure of the XML, so that you can be sure that the XML you are getting is of the right type and it has the right fields. Uh, it, this is, of course, very useful for input validation, because this, if you are using schemas, then uh, you are going to make the job of the attacker significantly harder. But many developers don't like using schemas uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, some of them being that schemas can be sometimes annoying to create and maintain. And there, there's also the difficulty of different types of parsing that you can have with uh, XML, which sometimes have uh, different uh, performance penalties and sometimes even different types of vulnerabilities uh, that appear if you are using one kind of parsing mechanism. Of course, XML is a major technology. has a lot of different standards and extensions. Some of them are specifically related to security. So, so, so those that you see on this specific slide here, some of them, such as XSLT, are related to transforming the data. Some of them, such as XPath and XQuery, are about navigating inside the data. Um, DTD and XML schema, or XSD, uh, are about uh, validating the data or its structure. Uh, and XML signature and XML encryption are for protecting the data that you have inside your XML. So let's first talk about the first step that you encounter when you try to handle something, some XML input from your users. And that is how you parse the data. There are two main approaches to uh, parse XML. The first one is SAX, uh, the simple API for XML. Uh, it is a state-based uh, process where you read the XML element by element, uh, and you are processing it as, as you go. Uh, this has the advantage that you don't need to keep the entire XML in memory. Uh, but of course, it has a different uh, uh, performance profile compared to uh, the other option, which, uh, which holds the entire XML in memory. Uh, so it may uh, not be as suitable for performance in certain situations. The other option is the DOM-based parsing, uh, the document object model, uh, which reads the entire XML and stores it into memory, uh, stores it in memory, uh, and then you can process it uh, however you want. This, uh, of course, uh, requires significantly more resources. And unfortunately, this also uh, opens opportunities for the attackers to uh, create denial of service situations by uh, forcing this parsing to take a very long time or perhaps never finish. Um, independently of which type of parsing technique we are using, um, we are always going to be vulnerable to XML injection. Injection vulnerabilities in general are, uh, are a mistake from the developer side. Uh, in fact, the, uh, most code that has some sort of injection in it, whether it's SQL injection, or command injection, or XML injection, or LDAP injection. Um, it may look syntactically correct, but it has a basic uh, misunderstanding from the developer side about the difference between uh, data and code. So uh, in this case, this means that uh, if the developer makes the mistake of uh, just putting user data as it comes as a string into an XML, 
uh, then it can result in changing the structure of the XML. And this is independent of whichever XML parsing uh, technique we are using. There is, of course, uh, the, ob uh, the obligatory disclaimer that if you try to create your own parser, that's almost always going to be a bad idea. This is a similar topic than trying to implement your own crypto or trying to implement your own session handling. There are many hidden pitfalls that may not be obvious uh, why you are developing the parser uh, that can come up in the future. We listed a few of them uh, on this slide. Uh, some examples could be how you handle C data blocks. Uh, which uh, are how you escape control characters in XML, uh, how you handle entities, uh, uh, XML entities and DTDs, uh, how you handle entity substitution, and how do you handle different types of character sets when certain characters may not necessarily mean the same thing. And as a general rule, whenever you are parsing XML, you should be doing schema-based validation. Uh, I sort of said this already, but it bears repeating that many of the vulnerabilities related to XML uh, become much harder to exploit and sometimes become uh, right, uh, downright unfeasible if you are using proper schema validation. So let's take a look at the uh, first type of problem, which is XML injection. Now, injection vulnerabilities in general um, uh, come from the fact that uh, the programmer takes user input and puts it directly inside some block of data, uh, or at least something that the programmer thinks is data, uh, but it's either going to be executed as code directly, as in the case of SQL injection or command injection, uh, or it is something where the structure of the data uh, can uh, determine what the program is going to execute, which is very often the case with XML. Because many XML documents don't necessarily have a fixed structure for every single document. You may have different tags that are optional. And when you are parsing the XML, depending on whether a tag is present or not, you may do a different thing. And sometimes this can allow the attacker to do something completely unexpected. For example, changing the administrator's password uh, just by modifying an XML that normally doesn't even have that tag. Um, so, this is probably the biggest problem with XML injection, that if we are just taking input from the user and putting it without any sort of validation into the XML, then this can change uh, what the, how the XML is going to be parsed. It will change what our program is going to do. Uh, and that can have a lot of different consequences depending on uh, what actually is contained in the XML. The other problem with XML injection is that uh, since the attacker is free to put anything that they want in the XML, they can just put something into the XML that either makes it invalid, which will cause some sort of error situation that we may not be prepared for, or they will put something into the XML that makes it extremely slow and hard to parse. So uh, this is the jumbo XML problem, as it's, uh, well, as it's widely known. Uh, where we just where the attacker just puts a large amount of data into the document, uh, into the into a text node or into an attribute or into multiple attributes, uh, thus uh, causing the parser to take uh, longer than normal to parse the parse the XML, which is normally not a huge issue because uh, most parsers should be able to handle situations like that. But we'll see some examples later on that uh, even with a relatively small XML, uh, you can create a disproportionately huge uh, burden on the parser if you do it right. So let's take a look at a really simple example. Let's say that we have a hypothetical web application where we are storing user credentials or user data in an XML. And when a user registers, as you can see here, um, they, they uh, access this particular URL. Then they register with their username, their password, and their email address. So those are the three fields in the request. Of course, for easier visibility, you just put these three parameters into the URL, so into the get uh, request. Uh, but they could appear anywhere else in the input, of course. So in this case, the user wants to register as with the username Bob, the password 12345. Um, just to make sure that we have a strong password policy, of course, and with the email bob at bobsmail.com. Um, so the application, in this case, 
uh, we'll just take each of these uh, each of each of these parameters as strings and put it into the appropriate uh, tag within the XML, so the appropriate text node. So it will put Bob into the username field. It will put the password, or rather the hash value of the password, because obviously we are not going to store passwords in plain text, right? Uh, so it's going to store the hashed and salted value of the password here. Then it's going to store the user type uh, or the user's email address here. And the user type is always going to be stored as regular user, because obviously we don't want users to be able to register as administrators just by using a publicly accessible API. So at first glance, this looks like it will work OK. And it will until a user has the bright idea of, uh, figuring, of uh, thinking about just how we are storing the data that, uh, that they are sending in these parameters and what they could do to change the structure of the XML where we are storing the data in. So obviously, they will create uh, this long request that we see here in the box on the top. And you can see that in this case, the email address is a very, very long string. That is what you see with the bold and bold and underlines. And of course, it starts with the normal email address. But then it actually we close the email tag, we close the user tag, then we create a completely new user tag and create all the arbitrary fields that we want. So in this case, we create a new user, which is going to be called attacker. Uh, we create a password for it and just hash it in advance. Uh, and this is the most important part. Of course, we set this user up to be an administrator. So we set up the type to be admin. Um, and then we fill out the rest of the, uh, of the, rest of the fields. Uh, specifically, we have an email tag here, and then put bob at attacker.com uh, in the text, uh, text node. Then when we take this input and we try to put it into the XML, directly, the same way that you did in the previous slide, then this is what's going to happen. At first, the first two fields, Bob and Password, will be stored normally. But when we start to parse the email field, we will actually store this entire long string in there. And as you can see, uh, this will actually change the structure of the XML. It will result in us adding a completely new user uh, with, uh, with an arbitrary username, password, and most importantly, a type. So by doing this injection, the attacker just managed to add an admin user to our database. And uh, they, they will be able to log in as this user and have significantly higher privileges. There's also another problem uh, related to um, injecting data uh, through XML. And this is related to how C data works. So I assume you have heard about uh, cross-site scripting or XSS, uh, which is a vulnerability where uh, we are taking some potentially malicious data that the user gave us, and we are displaying it uh, that, that, uh, on, on, some, on some web page. Uh, there are many different kinds of cross-site scripting. Uh, we are going to look at the persistent version. In this case, um, how persistent cross-site scripting works is that the attacker uh, uploads some sort of data, uh, probably and by changing some of their personal information or by posting a comment or wherever else they can send data to our website. Uh, and in that data, they send some malicious JavaScript, or perhaps not even JavaScript, but some HTML, uh, the HTML code. And then we store this data and uh, when some user requests the particular page that the attacker just submitted data to, for instance, they just submitted a comment to uh, a news article, then when, they, when someone opens that page that contains this comment, then the attacker's comment will be loaded. And the attacker's comment will contain some malicious JavaScript, which will then execute in the user's browser which can do a lot of different nasty things. Basically, if you can uh, run JavaScript like this in a modern web application, uh, it is possible to do anything that the user could normally do in their session. So cross-site scripting is very dangerous. Uh, the good news is that in modern web applications, it's getting much harder to commit this mistake. Because uh, 
And on their application, you typically don't write directly HTML as an output, but rather you use some sort of presentation uh, layer library or framework, uh, such as Angular or Jinja or, uh, <clears throat> or, uh, or, or uh, React or whichever one uh, you prefer. And the, these are very strict about escaping all data that you output. Uh, and they remove all sorts of active HTML content. But let's say that we have a situation where we read up some data that was previously stored as XML. And then we verify that that particular data doesn't contain anything dangerous, such as uh, script tags. And if it doesn't, then we just display it on the page. However, uh, in XML, we have uh, this construct, which is called CData. Um, to make to a long short story short, C data can be used to escape anything in an XML uh, that uh, that would be parsed as XML syntax normally. So uh, you could put anything inside the C data block that you want, and it will be uh, just escaped. So when the XML is parsed, uh, then that particular data will not be interpreted as XML content; it will just be interpreted as text content. Um, and here, if the attacker can uh, enter a script like, enter a uh, text like this on our input, which basically is uh, a very, very, uh, very simple cross-site scripting attack that just displays an alert, um, a pop-up alert that says XSS. Uh, if they obfuscate the script tags by putting the uh, angle brackets inside C data box, then if we are doing some uh, validation on this data, we may not find and we may not find that it has any tags at all. Um, but when we read this out from the XML, then the C data blocks will be resolved, and they and those particular elements will be changed back into angle brackets. And in the end, we will end up with this particular string. Now, of course, this is a pretty niche kind of problem. This is mainly a problem if you are directly writing into the HTML and you are writing into the HTML from an XML source. But it is still something to keep in mind. And another reminder that the best way to prevent this problem is to make sure that you escape uh, or sanitize your HTML output at the last step when you are already writing it into the HTML. So you should not validate this data, but you should validate this particular string before you write it into the HTML. Now, let's see how much time we have. All right, now, let's take a look at an example uh, of um, XML injection. So let me just quickly switch over to this virtual machine here. I hope this is still visible. So this is just an example of the application that we uh, like to use during our training courses. And this contains a lot of different types of vulnerabilities. Of course, this time, we'll be using it to showcase some of these XML problems. So as it happens, this uh, web application has the capability to create backups. And these backups are uh, going to be stored in XML. So if I, as an administrator, want to create a backup of our web application, uh, then I just click this button, and I get an XML that contains all of the data that's currently in the database, which includes all the users. And since this is a web application for uh, basically a car dealership, it will also contain cards. And well, it contains some other very unfortunate things. But that's, again, because this web application is used to showcase all kinds of vulnerabilities. So let's say that our attacker knows that this is a problem, that we are storing uh, our backups in an XML format. And we are just taking whatever is in, it is in the database and dumping it directly into the XML. So then what can they do? Well, if they know the structure of the XML that we are using, and they will be able to fit, figure it out one way or another, uh, then they just have to make sure that when we are exporting their user, then we are not just going to export that user that they are registered as, but they will be able to inject some arbitrary data into this XML, which will add another user, or perhaps do something else. So let's try this one out. Let's say that we want to register here on this application um, as an attacker. And we figure out what the XML structure looks like. 
So we figure that since the username is going to be the first field that's going to be stored in the database, and it's likely the one that can uh, have any length. Of course, we could also use any of the other text fields uh, if we wanted. We'll just specify this long string that you now see uh, inside the row application. Uh, and so we just select this entire long string. We specify this as our username. We just uh, use whatever else we need for the other fields. Fill in the password. Try to not fail the capture. And yes, we managed to register with this wonderful username. Now, of course, this is not really what the application is designed for. As you can see, uh, it doesn't exactly handle this kind of username well, but that's fine. We are not here to win any beauty contest. So let's just log out for now. And then we, of course, wait for the administrator to make a backup. So they will eventually do that. So the administrator goes to backup, uh, backup option and exports the database into XML. Now, if we start looking at what has been exported into the XML, Firefox is kind enough to sort it into uh, uh, user-friendly uh, views for us. We can see that after the normal users, this is the user that we just registered with the first name A, last name B. Um, and you can see that this is the string that we entered. It starts with username hacked and enter ends right right here. But you can see that in the XML, we actually now have two users. So all right, but I mean, that's probably not going to cause a problem, right? Well, let's see what it does. So we just save this. As you can see, I've created some, some backups just in case. And then we import it. Oh, man, you successfully import the user, uh, import the database. And it looks like that, uh, yeah, the user that we just added is this one. But looks like we got a new user added here as well, called new admin. So what is that all about? Of course, this user was injected by the attacker. So he already knows the password. And as it happens, we managed to give it administrator rights. So now we can basically do anything that we want. So uh, this was, uh, OK, resume share. Oops. Oh, sorry, I need to switch over there manually. OK, there we go. So this was a simple example of how XML injection works. Uh, now let's talk about what we can do to protect against this. First of all, schema-based validation helps a lot. It doesn't stop all of these situations, but it really restricts what the attacker can do. Um, the other th really important thing is that when you are putting user data into the XML, you shouldn't just put it there raw. You should do some kind of escaping or sanitization. Uh, in general, you should be probably using a library uh, which doesn't allow you to directly write into the XML uh, as, as text without uh, actually sanitizing or escaping it. The answer to this really depends on what platform you're using. For example, if you're using Python, then the good news is that it's really, really, really hard to, uh, to, to, uh, to do XML injection in Python. We looked at all the major XML libraries, and it really wasn't possible unless we deliberately uh, mess things up. So one of the answers here, of course, is to use a schema. So a schema is something that you can, that describes the structure of your XML. Um, and it basically tells you what tags you can have, in what order, how many of a tag you can have. And you can also restrict the value ranges of each particular tag. But there are some notes that you should also know about the schemas. First of all, schemas don't necessarily uh, make you vulnerable just because you use them. It's possible that you are loading a schema for a from a vulnerable location. The obvious example is if you are using a DTD schema, that the DTD could be built into the XML itself, which sort of defeats the purpose. Because then, of course, the attacker will send you a malicious XML where the DTD at the beginning will be configured just right for them, uh, for their attack to work. Or if you use a schema file in a public location that could be 
modified by the attacker, or if you are accessing the schema file over HTTP instead of HTTPS, and then the attacker can do a man in the middle attack and intercept the schema and replace it with something else. There's also another note, uh, which is something that a lot of developers forget about, is that uh, you, can, you can be very strict when you create a schema. And in general, it's a good idea to be as strict as possible when you define the various fields. So for instance, if you know that a particular field has to be an integer, but you also know that it's, for example, represents an identifier or a quantity, then you know it cannot be negative. So you should use positive integer instead of just integer, because that will add you an additional level of protection, because you just know that the attacker is going to try to give you invalid values no matter what. It's also a good idea if you have a, some sort of uh, non-integer value uh, to use a decimal type, because decimal uh, forbids the use of uh, infinity and not a number. But if you are just using float, or double, then they don't. So if you actually use float or double for an XML field in an XML schema, then the attacker can just use NAN, not a number, and that will technically be a valid value for that field. And that's obviously going to be a problem in your code. It's also a good idea to limit the length of certain fields, especially text fields or whatever, wherever you are expecting data, uh, because again, they can prevent it, protect you against uh, some vulnerabilities um, and, and really restrict what the attacker can do with malicious inputs. And if you know that a particular field can only take a certain number of values, a good example of this is uh, months. If you are uh, if you are dealing with some sort of uh, uh, date field, customized date field, then you can have an enumeration or list uh, and select from that. Uh, and only allow those specific values. So basically, you create a whitelist, which is always a good idea. You can also, we also have assertions where you uh, specify simple rules uh, for, for a particular field. OK, now let's talk a bit about the second type of vulnerability, which is probably the, uh, the other type of important vulnerability for XML. And that is the problem of XML entities. So this is a pretty good example of how a technology, which uh, was in use uh, a while ago, but not many developers use it nowadays, but many uh, XML parsers and uh, frameworks still support it due to compatibility reasons. Um, so DTD is the document type definition, uh, can be considered a precursor to the XML schema. And it's still in use in many places today. It has a lot of other capabilities than just defining the structure of the XML, but that was the original goal. It has something, some other functionality, however, other than just describing the various fields that you can have in an XML, and that is the, what it is called an entity. So entities can be thought of as variables in your XML, and there are these three main types that you will encounter. The first one you have probably seen a lot, uh, perhaps not in XML, but in HTML. And that is that are these predefined entities, which are aliases for special characters. And they are used for escaping them. So for instance, if you have ever escaped um, a particular angle bracket, uh, the lesser than or greater than sign, that it was then it was probably represented as ampersand LT semicolon or ampersand GT semicolon. And similar ones exist for the ampersand itself, the non-breaking space, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the predefined entities. We also have regular entities, which work similarly to variables in, uh, in, in, in programs. So in those cases, you specify an entity, give it a value, and then later, if you reference it in your XML, then the uh, entity will be replaced with that value. So it can be pretty handy if you want to be uh, a bit dynamic about what is contained in your XML. And there are also, however, external entities. And this is where things get interesting. So external entities can reference a URL, and that URL can point to an external resource. So what happens if you put an external entity into your XML? Well, we'll take a look at that. But let's uh, take uh, a look at the simple entities first. So if we have a substitution for an entity, uh, we can have entities in the substitution itself. So we can have an entity. Uh, which is resolved by resolving other entities. In this example, for instance, that you see here in this red box, we have defined the entity A as having the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, this string. Uh, then we define entity B as entity A eight times in a row. Then we define entity C as entity B eight times in a row, and so on and so on, until we get to entity M, 
which is uh, entity L eight times in a row. Then, once we are actually done defining the DTD, uh, the uh, entities, we have the XML itself, which contains, consists of a single tag, and that tag only has an M entity in it. Now, when this XML is parsed, uh, if you are using a DOM-based parser, then this M will explode into eight Ls. Each L will explode into eight Ks, and so on and so on. You can see that this becomes basically an exponential explosion of uh, how much memory it needs. And if you do the math, it comes out to uh, 640 gigabytes of memory, which is probably more than your server has, um, or perhaps not. But even if your server has this much memory to allocate to parsing this uh, particular XML, that's go still going to be a very, very significant denial of service. Now, of course, uh, this means that in order to carry out this attack, an attacker would need to send you an XML like this. Um, and an, an, an example of how this could be exploited in the wild in situations such as using SOAP is uh, to reference another XML uh, from the XML that, the attacker, uh, that uh, the attacker was able to modify. And the reference will point to an XML on a site owned by the attacker. And then you will be able, uh, then uh, your parser will load that XML. So that's why we have this uh, here in the second bullet point that uh, if you're using, for example, an XML digital signature, uh, then you can use the reference URL to point to a malicious XML uh, somewhere that basically has this kind of XML bomb inside it. So yeah, let's take a look at this one as well. Depending on how much time we have left. So we're just switching back here. So yeah, let's log out from the, the user for now. Log in as a legitimate user. And uh, now let's say that we want to uh, add a new car. And uploads, upload a new car to this website. Uh, and th thankfully for us, there is a way to import new cars uh, th just by importing an XML. So uh, this was probably added to migrate, help users migrate cars from a different version of this site. But of course, we'll be exploiting this to do horrible things. So let's just upload this file, which is basically what we have seen on the slide. And let's see what our program does when it tries to parse it. So as we can see, uh, it starts using quite a bit of CPU time. And it will keep using it, uh, keep using up a lot of CPU time and a lot of memory for a significant amount of time. Now, how effective this attack is really depends on what framework you are using. Uh, it's more effective on some platforms than others. Sometimes it even depends on the operating system. So the same attack on the same web application running on Windows has a very different effect. In this case, it was just a slight denial of service. It took maybe three or four seconds of the server being a little bit unresponsive. But if you consider that the attacker can just keep sending this uh, over and over, uh, then you can probably see that uh, this can be a pretty significant problem. And in some other cases, uh, this can result in uh, basically a complete lockup of uh, even the entire virtual machine. But of course, the real danger is uh, in uh, the XML external entity attack. This, there's a reason why this is a new entry in the OS top 10. Uh, in fact, it came in at number four in the OS top 10 2017. This problem has been known for quite some time before then, uh, at least since 2010. And there have been refinements over the, let's call it technique, over the years. Uh, but the core of the problem remained the same. So remember when we talked about the different types of entities, and one of them is called the external entity. Now, if you use an external entity, you can reference a URL with uh, that entity. And if you reference an external resource, such as, for example, a file, then when this XML is parsed and when this particular 
uh, entity is resolved, then uh, the parser will read up this file and put its contents into this tag, or into the text uh, node of that tag, which is, of course, uh, very unfortunate, considering that uh, if you are putting, uh, if you are allowing users to upload XML, then you're probably going to store that data somewhere, you're going to store the XML somewhere, and you're probably going to read out that data at a later point and to present it on some part of your website. So eventually, the attacker will be able to, uh, to read, for example, his own last name. And then his last name is going to be the contents of your shadow file, which is very unfortunate. So this is the first variant of this attack. When we uh, re include a local resource, and by doing that, we just uh, basically dump the contents of a file into the body of your XML file. Unfortunately, there are other variants of this attack as well. The second type, uh, the second variant of XXC is URL invocation. In this case, the URL is not a local URL, it's an external URL. It refers to uh, some uh, location, uh, in this case, inside our local network. So if the attacker knows the structure of our local network, like what servers there are, what services are running, uh, they may use this sort of URL to access a web service, which may not have any kind of authentication or other kind of security because it's running on our internal server, so it doesn't need to be protected, says someone. Uh, and thus, all we need to do to achieve uh, a particular function, in this case, changing a password, is just to do a GET request to that URL. So in this case, uh, the attacker puts this URL into the uh, external resource. And uh, then when it's referenced here, it will be resolved into this, uh, into this URL. The parser will make a GET request to this URL. And whatever it gets back as a response, it will put into the body of uh, the XML again. So in this case, the attacker now, now uh, kills two birds with one stone because they can potentially invoke some function, and they will also get the response from it. Now, of course, doing this one by one can be pretty annoying. So uh, fortunately for the attackers, and unfortunately for us, there is a third type of entity, or a fourth type of entity, uh, in addition to the ones we talked about before. And this one is called a parameter entity. So a parameter entity is like a normal entity, if you want to look at it in a very simple way, but it can also be used to define other entities, and it can also be used as a parameter inside other entities. Why this is useful is that uh, this allows the attacker to only have to do the successful insertion of an XML file once, and then they can just uh, change the content of a DTD file on their own server, and by doing that, change what will be actually done when you read up that particular XML file. So this is the canonical example. Um, in this case, we, uh, we, we define this send uh, entity here. But you can see that the send entity is not defined within the DTD of this file. However, we reference an external DTD file here on attacker.com. Now, attacker.com defines this DTD. Uh, and in this one, they can do whatever they want, which whatever they want our uh, XML to do when they send uh, an entity is parsed. In this case, they will define the send entity to uh, send a file to their site. And they do this by uh, specifying an external entity where the file content will be put into the URL. So that you can see here this person file, that means that the contents of the file which has been defined here as a shadow file, will be put here as a, as a parameter uh, into the URL. And then this URL will be, will be invoked. And of course, since the attacker has control of attacker.com, they will be able to figure out what was in the file because it will be in the request. It will be part of the URL. So uh, let's take a look at this one in practice as well. So we'll just switch back to our little example here. We won't need top anymore. So this time, instead of using the proverbial stone axe, let's use something a little bit more like a scalpel. And let's upload uh, something which has a, a valid structure uh, 
based on the XML the developed application is expecting. You can see that in this case, uh, we are just uh, uploading basically a car. Uh, a car. And uh, in this case, we don't put, don't put too many uh, fields into it. We just specify the field which are mandatory, which is name, description, and price. And into the description field, we put an, XXC, an entity called XXC, which is defined, as you can see here, as an external entity that references the PassVD file. Now, the PassVD file is, of course, not as juicy as the shadow file, uh, but the shadow file is only readable by the root user, and this will be good enough to demonstrate this particular vulnerability. So let's try this one out. Let's say that we, again, we try to upload a car, and now we upload this XXC version. Now our upload will just complete normally because this was technically a legitimate XML that our program was expecting. And then when we go into the list of cars, we will find the car that we just added on the second page. And as it happens, for the description of the car, we see the entire contents of the PSVD file which is good enough as a proof of concept to prove that, yes, an XXC attack is possible. But of course, we also learn a lot of things about the server, such as uh, where the, what the particular users are, uh, what shells they are using, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we protect against this attack? The good news is that protecting against this attack is not as difficult as it may sound. Because in general, if you are not using DTD, then the answer is just as simple as turning off DTD entirely. And depending on what programming language and what platform you are developing for, this may be done for you already. So for instance, if you are using, if you are developing .NET based applications and you are using at least, at least .NET 4.6, then most XML parsers will disable DTD by default. If you are using Java, uh, then we have some examples here for you. Uh, in general, you need to make sure to turn off uh, any kind of feature or option uh, which uh, mentions entities or DTD. Uh, and when you do that, uh, it should not impact your program normally because, again, you are not using DTDs. Uh, but it will basically prevent these kinds of attacks from working. In other platforms, it may be more or less difficult to do the same thing. Uh, for instance, in Python, this is actually a pretty hard problem because uh, some libraries uh, are, are going to be intrinsically vulnerable to uh, these, these attacks, while others will be immune. In Python, for instance, it's recommended to use the defused XML library to, to uh, validate any kind of suspicious XML that you may get. And it will basically prevent XML bombs and such from uh, exploding in your face when you try to parse them. So in closing, uh, let's take a look at a real world example of how an XXC attack in a well-known uh, system uh, could, be, could, could be exploited. So this particular uh, vulnerability uh, was found by a security researcher called uh, Adam Logue from Wisconsin. Uh, you will find the uh, URLs for the, for the write-up on this uh, vulnerability on each of these slides. So we basically just uh, uh, present that here so you can see uh, what the vulnerability was all about. Um, so basically, uh, the, check the checkout page of uh, TGI Fridays, a uh, well-known restaurant chain, uh, took JSON input and produced JSON output. However, uh, it accepted XML input as well. So uh, Adam uh, said it, uh, decided to uh, upload an XML file um, and change the content type, the mind type of the, of the file to application XML when uploading it. And when this happened, then he got a very, very curious error message. You can see it down here in this, uh, in this box at the bottom that he got JSON back, of course. He got, uh, because after all, the interface, the API is defined as getting JSON and returning JSON. But most of the JSON co um, uh, consisted of a single error message, uh, which complained about not being able to unmarshal the inputs. So basically parse 
the XML that was received. Um, and uh, the critical part to notice is the one part we highlighted here in red is that this was actually something that was being parsed as XML. You can also see it here at the bottom that it's trying to be, it, it tries to uh, parse the input, which was JSON, as XML. So then we have the idea that if we can do this, then what if uh, I send an XML where the process of parsing the XML will trigger an XXC vulnerability? And then even if I don't get the XML back, because the publication will not actually process it as XML, then just the step of parsing it uh, and uh, will be enough to return me some data in the error message that I receive when, uh, I, when I get the response. So he used the canonical example of uh, XXC, which is also the one that you can find in the uh, OWASP testing guide for uh, XML and the XML cheat sheet, which I, which I highly recommend everyone, by the way. Uh, that, uh, of course, it, was, it, it didn't look like he was going to actually be able to uh, get the web application to use the XML that he's sending. Uh, but by setting up this specific XML that you see here on the top, uh, he uh, could configure it so that whenever the XML was parsed, it would open this DTD file, which was on his server. And the, you can see the contents of that XML file here, uh, DTD file here on the bottom. Uh, it had defined the send command as invoking the netdoc URL. So netdoc here is perhaps, uh, it's, it's perhaps worthwhile to say a few words about that as well. Uh, so there are many different protocols that you can use uh, in order to extract information uh, through an XXC attack. Uh, and uh, there, there was a paper in 2015 uh, uh, which described quite a few of these. Uh, it's linked uh, within Adam's blog, so you can find it there if you want. Um, but one of them is uh, Java-specific. This is NetDoc. And it's, uh, it's a URL that's sort of a hybrid. It can reference a local file and a remote file. It, it works for both. Um, so when he used this one, then uh, he was lucky enough that uh, the, uh, the, the system uh, constructed this URL that you see here, the log.bz 6969 with the contents parameter, well, the uh, value of that parameter was the contents of the PSVD file. Uh, and then it generated an error when it actually tried to uh, send it, but the error message contained the entire URL. So he got this uh, particular error message when he sent the payload that we saw on the previous slide. And you can see here that uh, it was basically just an error message. Um, and it was very similar to the first one that it was unable to parse uh, the XML that he sent, that he sent uh, to the target. Uh, but you can see that in this case, as a, as a part of the parsing process, it tried to access this file and failed. Uh, but of course, it still displayed what file it tried to open, which in this case contained the entire URL. And thus, in this, it also included the password file. So this was a short-ish exploration of some of the typical problems uh, that happen in XML. Uh, and there are a lot more than this. So if you are interested in this topic, uh, there are many, many other sources uh, you can look up. Um, there are also other types of vulnerabilities that we didn't cover here. Uh, the, uh, perhaps the best known one is the XML signature wrapping attack, uh, which uh, exploits the fact that if you are not using an XML schema and you are using an assertion uh, for, for a single sign-on system, you may be, you may, the attacker may put two assertions in the same XML file. And while the first one has a valid signature uh, and a valid user, uh, because it's an actual valid uh, assertion for the uh, single sign-on system, uh, the second one will not have a signature at all, but it will, it will uh, it will authenticate as the administrator user. Therefore, if you don't have a schema and you don't check that there's only one assertion in the file, then you can end up in a situation 
where uh, you check the signature for the first assertion, but use the value from the second one, which is, a, which is of, of course, completely invalid. So yeah, this concludes the presentation part of, uh, of this particular uh, webinar. So I, I'd like to uh, thank, of course, all of you for coming and listening. I would like to give a very big thanks uh, to Ivan and the Zoom crew for providing a very smooth and seamless experience with the presentation. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it worked uh, very well for uh, presenting this. And of course, I'd really like to uh, thank Sid for, uh, for inviting me and having me along in this. So uh, with this, I would like to give the virtual microphone back to Sid for a second, if you'd like to say something or... Hey, Valas, thanks for an awesome presentation. Um, and uh, the OWASP uh, chapter, the uh, Hacker Thursdays uh, series is definitely uh, very lucky to have you uh, speak in the series. So thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, run for another meeting. Uh, and I have to go right now because that has already started. So uh, the control will be taken by uh, Prashant from here. Okay. And uh, uh, the Q&A can be started. Uh, I don't know if Prashant wants to add anything. Uh, so I give the mic to Prashant now. Uh, no, I'm fine. Thank you very much, Erno. Uh, it was a pleasure. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, okay, in that case, yeah. Uh, so thank you all uh, for participating. And let's see if we have any questions. Let me open chat here for a second. Okay. Oh, ah, there's a question here. Oh, I will answer this live. If I can, yeah. So, uh, so there's a question uh, from Prashant about whether there will be a talk on SAML and XML signature wrapping. Uh, I mean, uh, we'd probably be interested in that. If, if uh, you want a uh, you want a particular talk, um, uh, we could be persuaded to give one. We have a very personal, very personal story to tell if we want to talk about XML signature wrapping because actually we discovered a vulnerability just like that in the uh, system that handled the official uh, documents, uh, official document signing for Hungary. Uh, so basically everything uh, that is related to legal, to the signing of legal XML documents. Uh, we found a very similar problem. And uh, let's just say it was a, it was an experience. It was a, it was, it, it's a very, it's a very interesting uh, study. Okay. See if you got anything else. And yeah, um, I would just also like to thank again, uh, Sid and Prasant and everyone else uh, for my inviting me. And well, maybe we'll be coming back for future topics as well. So uh, as you can guess, we have uh, a lot of different areas where uh, where we will be very interested to talk about certain bite-sized aspects of security, as it were. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge is probably the time zones, because I think there is about nine hours of difference, because right now it's about 9 p.m. over here. But it's nothing that we can handle. Sure, Blaze. <laughs> so thank you very much, Blaze. Just to add, uh, we have our next Hacker Thursdays on 27 September. Mm -hmm. The topic is on um, reverse engineering through packet analysis. So please do check out our uh, meetup page. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have another uh, uh, webinar from you, Blaze, um, in the ne next months. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much as well. Okay. Okay. All right, bye.